Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're watching this from. I'm always thrilled to welcome the amazing Freda Johnson and Hawk Koch for Inside Hollywood. Hi, guys. Hello. Jen. Excited about who we're going to talk to today. Oh, and Bob Beecher. Hello, Bob. <laughs> Mr. Bob Beecher, Bob. smile, Mr. Beecher. You're on candid camera. <laughs> so I've missed that intro. It's always exciting to hear that. I don't know who edited it together, but kudos. Awesome. Really great. Bye. Builds up the excitement. So this is the first Inside Hollywood for the year. So I'm going to say that the year has officially started now that we have Hawk back. And we always enjoy this. It's always a highlight in my life to hear the great people you bring. And I'm sure everybody else has that same sentiment. So thank you for coming back. I know this is going to be a terrific interview. I can't wait to hear the skinny on all the stars and how Mr. Mahoney smoothed things over. So over to you, Hawk. Well, thank you, Jen. And thank you, Freda. And thank you, Bob, for doing an amazing job out at the, at the home and for the fund. So Jim Mahoney, from Gable to McQueen, from the Rolling Stones to U2, Jim Mahoney's job was to polish stars and make sure they continued to shine brightly. He earned a reputation as one of the best suppress agents in the business and a great golfer and raconteur. He has written a fascinating book that is just now being published called Get Mahoney. He lives in La Quinta and is a young 95 years old. Welcome, Jim Mahoney. Can't wait to talk to you. Thank you, thank you. It's great to be here. And there he is. Uh, I think, Beecher, did you wanna say something? You're still on the- uh... Yeah, I just wanted to say hi to Jim and tell him that a couple of weeks ago, I was having lunch with uh, some friends of mine who are members of Bel Air Country Club. So I said, oh, do you know a guy named Jim Mahoney? Uh, the place erupted with uh, a yeah, chorus of, of course, they know him. Bob Ramey, I don't know whether you know Bob Ramey was one of them. John Sandbrook, who's the historian at Bel Air Country Club, and many others. So they all wanted to send me to send their regards to you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he I was never allowed to play golf with him. I was, my handicap was too high, I think. <laughs> uh, so anyway, Jim, you're sponsored. I'm, I'm thrilled that you're here. I'm, I'm thrilled that you're here in lots of ways. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've had such a long and amazing life. There's no way to cover everything in the, in the time we have, but we'll get as many stories out as we can. And whatever we don't get out for all of you watching, go get his book, Get Mahoney, because it's unbelievable the stories but let's let's start at the beginning please talk about where you grew up uh and how much luck timing and location got you started uh, yeah i grew up in culver city uh which is a suburb of los angeles and uh it uh, uh the uh you forgive me, I sometimes lose it, and, but uh, it, it uh, really was Hollywood, Culver City. I mean, they had the Selznick Studios, you had the Hell Road Studios, you had MGM and, and, uh, and uh, all the studios. They had back lots where they were filming for, you know, Cowboys and Indians and that type of thing. And uh, it's like a kid's paradise. It was a paradise. We uh, each studio, like I mentioned, uh, had what they call outdoor properties where they shot, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, war scenes. Uh, they even had a New York Street. To, they didn't have to go to New York to film. <clears throat> they had their own New York Street right on the back lot. Right. So 
we we played <clears throat> cowboys and Indians and all kinds of stuff while they weren't shooting. Now I understand you were able to one night you you heard there was a big fire right near you and it was they were filming something. What was that fire? It was uh, it was gone with the wind. They uh, did all the outdoor uh, filming there on the forty acres and. Uh, and the uh, what they did it gone with the wind. There was the if you you most everybody's seen the movie. And when Atlanta burned, what they were really burning and filming were old uh, movie sets. And uh, so uh, it was quite dramatic and uh, it was fun for kids. And uh, they filmed a lot of outdoor. Uh, uh, film for uh, Gone with the Wind on that 40 acres. I, I just get the chills that you were there. I was seeing the we, land of, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. Now, I also understand that uh, you started a business as a little kid selling Cokes. And I wondered if that was kind of the start of your, your, your business acumen. That was, that was really my first job selling Cokes and cookies. I'd uh, sneak under the the uh, fence of where they were filming and sell my wares to uh, the cast and crew and and did pretty good. By the end of <clears throat> filming, I'd saved up almost a hundred dollars, and that was a ton of money in those days. Right. Well, I if I'm if I'm wrong, tell me. But I think your friend helped get the cases of coke, and he said, "Let's sell them for." A dime, they only cost a nickel. And I, was it true that you sold your your end for a quarter? <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was great in the book. Uh, now, from what I read, your dad was had a great work ethic and your mom was a strict disciplinarian. How did those attributes help you in your own life? Well, uh, uh, my my dad uh, was an interior decorator, a painting contractor, and uh, he was really good at what he did. And he he uh, he did work for a lot of people in the entertainment industry. And uh, one Sunday morning, he uh, I I'd been getting going back a little bit. I I got kicked out of four high schools, and. Um, wasn't one of the type of students you'd want to hang out with. But uh, um, I was, uh, one Sunday morning, my dad said, I want you to come with me uh, uh, and see a home that I just finished decorating. And uh, I think you you get a kick out of it. It's beautiful. And uh, he, <clears throat> I said, I, I interrupted him and I said, it's, uh, I'm sorry, but I'm going to the, the, the beach. And uh, he said, he, he stopped me mid-sentence and said, no, you're not going to the beach. You're going with me. And uh, I got the message. He wanted me to go with him. <laughs> and we, we got in the car and I said, where are we going? And he said, Encino. And, well, Encino was a sl sleeper jump to uh, took a, an hour at least to get out there. And then now, so... We get out there, and uh, I'll never forget the place. It was uh, 4525 Bennett uh, Avenue, and uh, and it was a magnificent estate. It was the first place I'd ever been where you pressed a button and spoke into a microphone explaining who's calling. Say, uh, Mr. Mahoney, come right in. The gate opened, and we drove up this log driveway, and and uh, in, into a parking area, which was an open garage, and there must have been eight brand new cars, which was unusual because it was like 1947 uh, uh, or something, you know, and they, they, Detroit hadn't really got kicked into gear with these all nice cars, a nice new Jag, a, a, a brand new Cadillac convertible, a, a, a Woody, if you remember that, was. Uh, sure. In, uh, a big deal in those days and uh, a couple of uh, motorcycles and uh, I, I was impressed needless to say and uh, we we walked over to the main house and off to the, uh, the uh, 
to the side was a swimming pool and a couple of guys having brunch and we went over and uh, uh, I was flabbergasted that the sitting there is is that not, not only that God was gone with the wind star Clark Gable but also a fellow by the name of Howard Strickling who was the head of publicity and marketing at MGM Studios and and one of the most important PR people in the business and and Strickling and and I uh, uh, Gable and my dad went into the uh, the house to uh, do do business or whatever and I'm stuck there with a fellow by the name of Strickling I never heard of but it turns out as I said he was the number one marketing guy in the in the in the business and um he started interviewing me and I finally I realized that my dad set this whole thing up he was hoping that I'd get a job and this was a opportunity that didn't come along very often and as I had a nice chat with Strickling, he asked me what I was doing. I told him I was a senior at USC, and and he said, "What are you majoring in?" And I said, "Girls." And uh, it wasn't the way to get a job, I guess. But he took a liking to me, and he's in when Gable and my dad came back. Uh, he told. Uh, uh, Strickling told my dad, uh, I had a nice chat with your boy, and I told him if he, when he gets out of out of school, if he'd like to come out to the studio, I'll see if I can find a spot for him in my de department. And with that, Clark Gable says, if he goes to work for you, Howard, I want him to handle me. Wow. How's that for a beginning? Wow. Yeah. That was look, we have their picture of you and uh, Gable. Uh, Jen, why don't you put that picture up there? There's young Jim Mahoney with Clark. That was wow. Sunday Sunday morning and and Monday morning. I went out to the studio when I was employed as an apprentice publicist. <laughs> How about that for a break? That, that is yeah. that, that's some that's again that's timing, luck, yeah. and and I must say given your whole career talent you you didn't know it then but you had the talent and uh, i think your your father's work ethic and the way your mother uh disciplined you and and made sure you were doing things even though you got kicked out four times by the way will you just tell that story of the fire hose i, I love that story well i was uh, uh, it uh, that was the first school of loyola jesuit uh, 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 facility that was and is today probably the, the, the best in the country and um, uh, obviously I abused the, the uh, position but uh, the uh, we were called to assembly at this Loyola High School one day and they didn't really have a, a, the, the right uh, uh, and that we didn't have an auditorium at Loyola at that point in time. And what we had instead was a Quonset hut. And, you know, you try to get 250 students into it. It was terrible, no, no air conditioning. And, uh, and it was, just, everybody was squeezing and screaming and yelling. But, and uh, I was standing with a, my good friend, Al Pollard, who later went on to become a, great football player and a, and a television uh, announcer. But uh, we were standing in, in, in no room to sit. And behind us was a fire hose up against the wall. You, you remember what they looked like, snake affected. And uh, Pollard says, if you have, have any uh, guts, he used another word, uh, you'd... Uh, turn that son of a bitch on and we get out of here. And I, I said, uh, I, I grabbed the, uh, uh, the, the hose and the, the, what do you call the top at the end of the hose? The, uh, right. Right. Nozzle. The what? Nozzle. The nozzle. Yeah. And 
and uh, and I sort of fooled around with it and aimed it at some of the students. And and while I'm fooling around with it, my friend Pollard turns the son of a bitch on, and we <laughs> we hose down the entire assembly. And needless to say, the uh, I was out of that school at the, uh, on another one, but uh, that was Loyola, and I. Uh, Believe it or not, uh, I helped the, the school and then Jesuit cause over the years. And uh, lo and behold, the, the, uh, the principal, this is in 19, uh, no, you know, it was 10 years ago. And, I, and uh, he came over one night to have a cocktail and he brought, brought a, a uh, a diploma for me. Yeah. <laughs> so in effect, my mother would be thrilled to death to know that I graduated from Loyola. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. So you go to work at MGM uh, and Gable's your first client. Yeah. And tell me, you, you mentioned something called, what does feeding the beast mean? Uh, uh, well, uh, there was about 30 some odd people on the contract, uh, uh, to the studio at that time. Uh, Gable was number one, obviously, but you, you know, he had, uh, Fred Astaire and, uh, Gene Kelly, Gene, yeah, Gene Kelly, but they went on and on. And, uh, the newspapers and, and, um, uh, one of the, big changes at today, but the newspapers have always had uh, columnists that covered Hollywood, like Hedda Hopper was the LA Times and a syndicate, and Lu Lu Luella Parsons was a big deal and it's syndicated by the Hearst organization. And every city had their uh, uh, newspaper, they would have an entertainment section, and in New York there were a columnist by the name of Earl Wilson, but to, to make a long story short, the, uh, every city had an entertainment uh, section in their newspaper, and those people were looking for stories, Hollywood stories, every day, and uh, that was one of my jobs was to come up with stories and feed them to the uh, the uh, columnists and. Uh, and uh, there were about 15 publicists in the department. Uh, and and there's like maybe three apprentices or junior publicists that uh, would um, feed the, the beast, <laughs> so to speak. Wow. Every day we'd, we'd come up with some kind of story, uh, whether it's true or not, and feed it to them. And um, it was great the next day if it um, appeared in the paper. And and you moved up. You, you did very well. Uh, they really loved you at MGM. Well, I, the I, Korean I, War broke out. Yeah, and then I went to Korea and uh, came back, and they made me a junior publicist at the studio. They th thought I was some kind of a hero, Audie Murphy or something, and uh, they were really uh, way off base. But it was nice, and uh, it was good PR for you. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> uh, and you had met? Did you get married at that point? I know you had met your wife Pat. Yeah, yeah, I got married, and then um, one of these uh, columnists uh, I was entertaining at the studio and lunching with uh, asked me if I'd consider coming to work for him, and. Uh, be his leg man, which is, uh, it's in effect, um, uh, a, a, an assistant to the columnist. And the, my, this fellow, his name was Harrison Carroll, and he was a beloved character with, in the industry. And, uh, and he, he loved stories that, uh, you know, with like broken homes or, uh, uh broken, broken bones, you know, those were the kind of stories he loved. And um, he asked me if I'd like to come to work and be his leg man. And 
I got to thinking about it, and, and I wasn't a very good publicist, to tell you the truth. I, I wasn't a very good writer either, and all things that you learn. And um, so I took the job as uh, Harrison's assistant, and uh, and uh, and I. I would go to a different studio every day and dig around for stories and have lunch with one of the stars. And, uh, and, and uh, I got to know a lot of people in the industry. Obviously, everybody wanted to get their name in the paper. And th another part of my job was going out at night to uh, nightclubs and and uh, and um, uh, restaurants. Restaurants. So the night, I, I, the uh, uh, there were. The, we don't have that setup in in Los Angeles or Hollywood anymore. There was Ciro's, one of the hottest nightclubs in the country. You know, the Mugumbo. Then you had the Coconut Grove and uh, and uh, uh, Italian restaurants uh, uh, galore. And uh, uh, did you have? Did you have a? Uh... You used to eat at Martoni's a lot. I remember. Did you something with Gary Cooper? Did uh, he have a problem there? I uh, yeah, the Martoni's was a good re good restaurant, and um, uh, it was run by a couple of Italian kids, Mario and Tony, obviously. And uh, I used to like to go there, but there were several re restaurants, Romanoffs, and uh, and uh, that I frequented, and. Uh, Chasen's. Chasen's was one of my favorites, and uh, but uh, one uh, one day I was interviewing um, um, uh, let's see, maybe I'm getting ahead of my story. I was just thinking of you were having a drink at, at Martoni's and you saw somebody in a corner table. Well, that was Sonny and Cher, yeah, and. I think uh, you Gary, Gary Cooper and Anita. Oh, Eckford. You, yeah, that's another story about uh, <laughs> I was sitting at the bar waiting for the uh, PR guy to, to join me for dinner, and I uh, heard all kinds of uh, noise and yelling and laughing and screaming. Like a couple of people were really having a good time in uh, one of the booths in the back of the restaurant. And a few minutes, I said, who the hell is that? And he said, he put his finger to his mouth like, I, I can't talk, you know, look cool. And, I, and a few minutes later, the, the characters that came back out of the booth and, and who the hell was it but Gary Cooper. And following him behind was Anita Eckberg, one of the most gorgeous creatures of all ever. And I'm thinking to myself, Gary Cooper's a, a happily married man. This is uh, could be terrible. This is the kind of stuff you want to hide if you're a press agent. But now I'm writing a column. But I thought better of writing about it. And so a couple of days later, it uh, 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 I was calling in the morning to uh, see who was working at the studio. And if this, this was at Paramount and um, Gary Cooper was making a movie and I told the press agent, I'd like to come out and talk to Gary Cooper. And I went out and talked to the, and the Gary Cooper, you know, it was a yep, nope type of uh, interview. He very seldom got anything interesting out of him. And um, I said, Mr. Cooper, I, uh, I just, uh, there's something that I want to discuss with you, but I, uh, I just, uh, he, what the hell do you, you mean? What, what do you want to discuss with me? And I said, Anita Eckberg. And he said, oh, my God, Jesus Christ. Well, you're not going to write about that. Huh? I said, I'm not going to write about it, but I just wanted to tell you that somebody will, and you're going to get in deep shit with your wife and family. And uh, he said, well, where the hell can I go to? In, 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 yeah, you know, I'm going to be known to uh, good work. I said, well, I know a few, a few places where you can go and I, you'll have your privacy. And I told him about a few restaurants, like the, the La Venta Inn was a nice place and, and good food, fine wine. And, uh, and no one will ever know that you were there. And I said, there's a couple of places. In, and I told him about places in 
in, in Malibu. And, uh, and we became fast friends. As a matter of fact, later when I be, went back into the PR business, uh, he became a client, hell of a nice guy. He, I, I think one of the things that I did for him it was, it was more important than, a, than an Academy Award. I got he and his, his wife and daughter on the cover of Sports Illustrated. And that to him was the, the end all, but uh, they, they fantastic. Great moral character, uh, Mr. Mooney. <laughs> Great moral character. Now, when you when you're going to those places, I understand you ran into Ava Gardner. Uh, well, one of my uh, positions uh, uh, assignments at the studio was uh, getting a limousine and uh, picking up whomever is uh, the big star going to Europe or to South America or wherever. And uh, I would take them to the airport and see that they were well ensconced. And, and that was my job for the day. And uh, uh, what, I, what are the hell? You, were, you picked up Ava Gardner. She was a little late, I think, wasn't she? Oh, oh the, yeah. One day I know where they were going. Uh, um, this is before you got to uh, know Frank, but yeah. Uh, wait a second. You what? showed up at the house to pick her up. Oh yeah. Well, on one one occasion, it was Thanksgiving, as a matter of fact, and uh, I was getting married two or three days later that, on the twenty ninth. But uh, uh, I uh, was picking up Ava and taking her to um, uh, the airport, and. Uh, uh, I get the limousine, go to the, go to Ava's house, and um, as we back into the driveway, I got out of the car and uh, from the upstairs, uh, the door, window opened and it was Ava, and she said, uh, "Good morning, honey. Uh, go into the there, there and fix yourself a drink," and uh, that's what I per. Uh, what I was, where I was going, and I got to the bar, and all of a sudden, behind me, uh, uh, this voice screams out, "Who the hell are you?" And I turned, and it was Frank Sinatra. Is during the dark ages, as far as he was concerned, he couldn't get a job, and his marriage was on the rocks with Ava, and uh, he was in bad shape. He couldn't get a job. Lost his. He, MGM took him off contract, uh, Decca Records, Capitol Records, whomever it was, dumped him. So he was in really bad shape. And so it didn't surprise me if it, it, uh, his attack, <laughs> so to speak. So well, uh, uh, there, we got a picture of you and Ava that I think we should show the, the people out there. Uh, I'm about to get the Bloody Mary on the way to the airport. There you go. There you go. There's a very young Jim Mahoney with Ava Gardner, one of the one of the icons of our industry. Wow. So you met Frank that one day, but how did yeah. you I understand you left eventually you left Harrison Carroll and you got a job at with Henry uh, Rogers and Warren Cowan. You no, know, let me. Uh, oh, did I miss something before that? Uh... Uh, I got to know, like I said, a lot of people, damn near everybody. I did that for three years, going out to nightclubs every night and uh, going to the studios every day. And uh, on one occasion, uh, 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 Pat and I, my wife and I were sitting at the bar waiting for a press agent, uh, I forgot his name, and then he was going to join us for dinner. And... Um, uh, Sinatra comes in and uh, he said, why don't you join us for dinner? And, and so Pat and I joined him for dinner and it was with Peter Lawford and his wife and uh, and I think it was Leo DeRocher, the uh, uh, legendary baseball manager. And uh, so we had a nice dinner and uh, he said to me, he says, how come you never come out to the studio? And I said, well, uh, your sets are always close to the press. And, you know, he said, that doesn't stand for you. You know, anytime you want to come out and see me, come on out and see me. 
And uh, the next day, I got a phone call from a press agent on the movie. And uh, she said, uh, uh, Mr. Sinatra came in this morning and asked me why I never invite him, uh, Jim Mahoney, to the set. And uh, she, she, she was instructed to call me immediately and invite me to the studio, which I did. And in the course of the conversation, Mr. Sinatra says to me, uh, how long are you going to stay in that hokey business? And I said, until something better comes along. And he said, it just did. I want you to work for me. To make a long story short, uh, he was with a company called Rogers and Cowan, a PR firm with the name of Rogers and Cowan. He right. said, you call Rogers and Cowan and, and uh, they'll know exactly what I want. And I want you to work for me. And, and I said, what do you want me to do? And he said, I don't know, but I'll figure out something. And that's how I went to work at Rogers and Cowan. And uh, that was the last step before I went into business for myself. Now, there was there's there's a there's a line that I don't know if it was Warren who taught you this, but and I guess it's the same thing about feeding the beast. But I read activity breeds activity. Yeah, that was that was one of Warren's. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Warren, Warren was a hell of a PR guy. Yes, he was. Uh, that's how it all started with Sinatra. And, and, you know, if you have Sinatra on your client list, it, you you can draw and 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 uh, um, uh, some interesting people will follow suit, you know, and uh, I started handling a, a lot of in, interesting and important people. Well, uh, one of them was a was you know the story to end all stories at the time, which was the Eddie Fisher, Debbie Reynolds, Elizabeth Taylor story. How did you handle that? It wasn't easy, but uh, Eddie Fisher uh, made it easier because he just did some stupid things. You know, he's got uh, he's 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 married to Debbie Reynolds and he's uh, having an affair with Elizabeth Taylor. And uh, it's pretty high, hard to hide after a while. And uh, he co called me one day and he says, uh, um, uh, I'm going to uh, Europe. And I said, what's going on in Europe? And he said, uh, Elizabeth and I are going to Europe. And I said, Jesus Christ, Eddie, you can't do that. You've got a pregnant wife at home. And, you know, at least fake it. Come home. Come come back. Uh, and uh, break up. And, but uh, you can't. You're, you're running your career and, and, it, and Elizabeth's not going to be any better off. And, but instead, he went to New York with uh, with uh, uh, Elizabeth, then she was making Cleopatra. And uh, uh, one day- and Richard uh, Burton in there too. Yeah, and one day uh, he calls me and he says, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I said, he said, uh, Elizabeth and Richard Burton are, are a, a pair, they're together and uh, I said, I thought you were with her. He said, no, he's he's taken over. I, 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 what should I do? And I said, shoot the son of a bitch. There isn't, there isn't a, a, a court in Italy that will charge you. <laughs> and that was my advice to Eddie. <laughs> the last bit of advice for Eddie. He, just, he, he went in the toilet after that. Oh, my God. Now, uh, I understand you... Uh... You had some good advice to a presidential candidate in 1960. Is that uh, JFK? Jack, Jack Kennedy. Yeah, well, I, part of the Rat Pack is I was representing at that time was Peter Lawford. And uh, Peter uh, would have a poker game every Sunday, every Sunday afternoon, and, and a barbecue at his home in Malibu, and they were lovely parties 
you never know who's going to show up, but they were always interesting. Marilyn Monroe was there on, a, on occasion, and Judy Garland was there all the time. And, and the, the, the guest list was just alarming, to say the least. And uh, um, where was I? You're talking about how uh, you were talking about what, what he oh, needed yeah, to yeah, do. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, one night, the, one night, the... Uh, the, the conversation, as usual, would turn to politics, and everybody was so thrilled that uh, uh, Kennedy was going to be uh, on the ticket, and uh, there, in tick, and he would he he occasionally would come to the poker game, as a matter of fact. But uh, they were uh, all excited about the fact that uh, JFK was going to be the president. And unfortunately, or fortunately, as the case might be, I spoke up one night I might have had too much to drink and told his uh, un assembly that uh, JFK better get his ass out to California and do some uh, um, uh, campaigning. Uh, otherwise, he was going to be uh, left at the door and, uh, and uh, he should uh, work, work on uh, the veterans uh, uh, get them behind you because there was a big contention here in Southern California or in California. And the next, and I thought to myself, I, you know, uh, I, I'm entering a strange world and I should find my own business politics as it was. And the, the next morning, Pat Lawford called me and she said about last night and I'm thinking to myself I'm getting fired right now she said last night you were absolutely right everything you said is what uh, 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 Jack Jack, Jack uh, should be doing and and I want you to do me a favor and and write him a letter and just express those your opinions they were marvelous and it's exactly what Jack needs and so I said, oh, I'll, I'll write a letter to Peter because, uh, and let, let Peter give it to, to JFK. I, I think it's a little much for me to be telling the president, the potential president, about how he should conduct his campaign. And she agreed, and we gave it the, the, the letter to Peter. And a couple of days later, Peter is calls me around five o'clock in the afternoon and he said, what are you doing for dinner? And I said, I'm going home. What do you have in mind? He says, well, JFK is at the uh, airport and he wants to have dinner with you. And uh, that's. Wow. That, wow. Wow. Yeah. That's what I, I, I was floored, you know, and I go to dinner. I've never been impressed uh, more by any, any, buddy that I'd ever been around in celebrity or otherwise he was something uh, else he was uh, charming intelligent attractive and all those all those nice things and uh, he asked me hey would I consider going to work for him and I said well I got a, a wife and I must have had three or four kids by then and I said, I've got to talk that over with my wife. And uh, needless to say, we decided that I had a pretty good business going for myself at that time. And, and it was growing. And, uh, and you know, I, I always had two or three kids and, and a pregnant wife. <laughs> and so <laughs> we, decided, we decided we were better off where we were. And... Uh, so be it. I never, you never can tell what would have happened if I'd have gone to work for Kennedy. Wow. Just, just great. I get the chills. Uh, <laughs> now you worked for Frank and, and I think it was 1962. Cause I remember my, my dad was running Frank's movie company. And, uh, I, I think I was still in high school, but all of a sudden I saw my dad's face turn. I said, what happened? And he said, uh, I just heard that Frank Jr. was kidnapped. And uh, I, I think I, I, I have to go to Tahoe or, or Cal Neva Lodge. And well, actually, that was also a very famous story that you were in the middle of. What happened uh, with that Sinatra kidnapping? Well, the, uh, actually, uh, 
Yeah, there were th three kidnappers and uh, they snatched him out of a hotel <coughs> uh, dressing room and uh, and they were off and uh, I got a call uh, from Mickey Rudin, who's Sinatra's attorney, and he said, uh, Frank wants you in, uh, in, in Reno right now. And I said, what's going on in Reno? He said, you'll find out when you get there. And I said, where's Frank staying? He said, I don't know, but he wants you up there right now. And as it turns out, uh, um, I got up there and, uh, and Frank was in the uh, pr presidential suite at the Mapes Hotel, and uh, which was, believe it or not, the first high rise built after the war. It, and it was, you know, it was like about 10 floors and uh, quite impressive in those days. So uh, I was in the suite with Frank and uh, he said, listen, you please handle the phones. They've been going rattling all afternoon. And, uh, and so my job was to handle the phones and everybody was calling, but Judy Garland and Peter Lawford and they yeah. Uh, so I was fielding the calls, and uh, the uh, the next day, one of the first calls came in was uh, from uh, um, Hoover, uh, J. Uh, Hoover, J. W. The, the head of the FBI, and uh, I went to the the, the uh, Frank's suite. Uh, which had joined mine. And then uh, I said that uh, and the phone rang uh, and, uh, and and I picked up the phone and uh, I, it was, uh, I said, who's calling? And he said, just tell him Momo, uh, he'll understand. And so I go in and I said, Frank, you got two calls. J. Edgar Hoover is on line one and so if somebody by the name of Momo is uh, on line two, who do you want to talk to? He said, I'll talk to Momo. Momo, as it turns out, was Sam Giancana, the number one gangster in the country. And, and uh, now I'm thinking to myself, Frank's not only got the number one uh, cop in the country, he's got the number one hood in the country go, go chasing after the kidnappers. And I said, so he, they're going to find him. <laughs> even, even Frank thought that was rather amusing. And <laughs> wow. And, and between fun. them, I'll they did finally that. catch the, the guys and the, the money, uh, they, they found the money. Yeah. They didn't have time to spend any of it. <laughs> well, tell me a little bit. Now, I, I was fortunate enough to see if a couple of sides of Frank when my dad ran his company and when I was doing Rosemary's Baby with Mia uh, and used to be down at Tamarisk. Uh, give me a, you know, there, there's always been bad and good about Frank. And I don't think anybody other than you was ever as close to Frank. Tell us about the good and the bad. Give us give us a little insight into the both the good and the bad of Frank. Yeah, you know, uh, is there was no bad about Frank. You know, the the uh, rumors that he was associated with the gang or the mob. Or, um, he, he was associated with him because more often than not, when he was uh, coming up uh, in the uh, entertainment world they owned the nightclubs and the bistros and saloons where he worked and they paid paid him and he never forgot that and uh, you know the copacabana and uh, sands hotel he finally was doing quite well and he owned part of the sands hotel and uh, uh, as as far as the good is concerned i mean he, he legendary the money and, and in uh, things that uh, he did for people, I mean, it's mind blowing. I mean, he 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 gave money to everybody. I mean, it, uh, 
he, uh, he, he put on shows. He'd go to China and put on shows for disabled children and that type of thing. And, and uh, that's why he won the Herschelter Award. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Everything he did. You have a great story about Judy Garland's funeral of what how Frank helped there. He paid for it. Yeah. Unbelievable. Uh, that, and, and there's a lot of uh, stories about it. Uh, his, I remember we'd go to a restaurant, for instance. These are minor things, yeah, but uh, he, he never tipped anybody uh, uh, in less than a hundred, he carried hundreds on him up until a certain period of time. And uh, we'd be at a restaurant and uh, he'd take, and take a couple, two or three hundred dollar bills and throw it on the floor under the table. And I asked him, I said, well, why are you doing that? And he said, these are the people that clean the place. They need some help. And uh, that's aside from the waiter and the captain that he took care of. After a while, it got to a point where he, he gave, uh, you know, a, a, I don't know, maybe a thousand dollars to Jilly, who was always with him. Uh, and Jilly would uh, hand out the, uh, the, the tips to the, uh, the waiter and the, the captain and, and the he was quite a giver. He built a church down the street. He used to pay for kids' dinners, you know, he said. Yeah. No, I, I remember my dad and mom went on a trip with him around the world to, for charity. Uh, I think they had a big gala in Monte Carlo, I remember, that yeah. Frank paid for everything and uh, never took any money for all the shows that he did. That's right. Yeah. Good pretty, pretty amazing. I've, I've, you know, you work with him all the time. I was just fortunate enough to meet him uh, again, another legend. Uh, now, I understand there's one that you weren't too happy about uh, that you worked with uh, who uh, wasn't the, the same as Frank Sinatra. Let's talk, tell me a little bit about your favorite uh, movie star, Steve McQueen. He was a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> one day I was sitting in... Uh sitting in uh, Frank's office at, in, in the William Morris Agency. And uh, we were dis discussing a picture, the ever so few that was about to film uh, in a few days. And uh, we were going over type of uh, photographer that I wanted to hire to cover the movie and other PR problems. That, <laughs> And uh, so Sinatra's on the phone, and he he's all of a sudden explodes. What? What? what, what? And what are you talking about? And the conversation goes on for a few minutes, and he hangs up, and he says, "Howard, Howard was your dad, and he was uh, in the next room, his office adjoining Frank's, and he and Howard uh, says." He yells, Howard, Howard. And uh, he answers, you know, yeah, 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 I'm on my way or something, you know. And, and uh, he comes in and Frank tells your dad, Smokey's out of the movie. He's out of the friggin' movie. Do you hear me? Smokey's out. And your dad says, well, Frank, I mean, we're, we're shooting on Monday and he works all day. And he, I don't give a, he's out of the movie. And uh, turns out Smokey was Sammy Davis Jr. And Smokey, Sammy, had a pretty big part, needless to say, in the movie. Uh, it was a meaningful part. And, uh, and uh, your dad comes in and, and you know, is... Uh, pleading with Frank, I said, Frank, we can't do that. He said, "You heard me. I want him out of here. Who, 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 who will we put in?" And and I said, "I I had this client that that was uh, had a TV series, uh, wanted dead or alive, and he's now in movies, and um, he'd be perfect for the part." I'd read the script, obviously, and Sinatra, 
Sinatra said, yeah, I know that kid. Why not try him? Good idea. And he said, uh, I said, his agent is Stan Kamen at the William Morris Agency. And he, uh, uh, sure, he'd like to hear from you, Howard. And Howard said, I'll be right back. And one phone call to another phone call. And uh, Steve McQueen was assigned the, the part that uh, Smokey or Sammy was uh, and that was the start of McQueen's career in the motion picture business. I mean, there might have been some hokey things that he did bit parts, but that was the first important part McQueen ever got, ever had, and he did his best with it. Well, yeah, but that's, there was something about second billing. Oh, that was another. Like there's something about second billing. That was. Uh, uh, Boomtown. Boom yeah, they were going to remake. You made the item up about Boomtown. But what? The, uh, the, the, you made up the item about he and uh, Garner putting together a movie. Oh. When he, this is after you've been working for him for a while. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so it, it doesn't matter. And by the way, for those of you there, the, the gentleman sitting off to the side is one of uh, Jim's great sons, uh, uh, Sean Mahoney. So, Sean, thanks, thanks for helping. Uh, I'd like to say hi. <laughs> there he is. Thank you. Uh, tell me, there was a. Uh, I I worked. I think I worked on. I I produced a movie that was Lee Marvin's last movie. But you had uh, quite a run with Lee, and I know you liked him a lot. And he he was. Uh, you were involved in that whole palimony thing with Michelle Triola. How did again again just nightmares of PR and you seem to handle it all well. How did, how did that come about? Uh, well, uh, Lee was a real character, but you know, he, uh, he was, uh, one hell of a guy and, uh, a, literally a war hero. He got his ass shot off on Iwo Jima and, uh, was hospitalized for, uh, almost a year, but uh, he uh, he was a good friend and sorry to see him go. But uh, uh, what was it? I was just thinking, I was remembering a, a, a story about, I don't know, the car or something when they had a fight on Malibu and couldn't get out of the house. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he called me one day and he said, we got a problem with Michelle. Michelle Triola was his live-in. And uh, this was when, uh, this was the start of palimony and uh, all kinds of problems she was causing. And um, he calls me one day and he said, Michelle's uh, uh, sitting in a car across the street. This is in Malibu. And she's threatened to kill me. And uh, if I step out of the street or even try to leave here, she's going to run me over. And I, and, uh, and uh, I said, what do you want me to do? And he said, well, do something. And I said, I'll call you back in 10 minutes. And as luckily for, for me and for Lemon, I it made it a habit of, uh, me of uh, befriend, befriending the police departments wherever client my clients lived. Like Marvin was in Malibu, and uh, George C. Scott was uh, in a in an, uh, another part of Malibu, uh, and uh, so I called a friend of mine. Uh, he's the under sheriff in the L.A. County. And he said, what can I do for you? I said, I'd like you to arrest somebody and hold them overnight and, uh, and you'll save a life. And he said, I'll get back to you. And 10 minutes later, he called me and he said, we've arrested uh, Michelle Triol and she's in the slammer in Malibu. Anything else I can do for you? And I said, no, I appreciate it very much. And so those are some of the kind of... Uh, like, situations that uh, you know, a little uh, PR. Yes. 
Uh, unbelievable. Uh, I, I just, they blow me away. By the way, I forgot to show a picture of you and Frank. Uh, Jen, if you could put up, I think there's a photo there. Oh, that's Frank and Mia. Yeah, we'll get to that story. Uh, yeah, I was, again, I, we intersected along a lot of times, Jim. I was uh, actually uh, working on Rosemary's Baby, and I was there the moment Mickey Rudin came in with the uh, with the divorce papers. But talk about Frank and Mia. I had lunch with what her. Happened there. Day. I had lunch with her that day. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I got to the table of the commissary at Paramount, and uh, she's drinking a bottle of wine, and and it was well into it. And I said, "What are we celebrating this morning, or this evening, or the, or today?" And she said, "My divorce." And that was the start of it right then and there. And you're right. Uh, Rudin had b visited her that morning and with the papers. And uh, it was. And that now how you you had to were you in a position always to calm Frank down? I mean, you know, I saw his temper and his temper was basically at least what I saw are people who. He didn't suffer fools very well. That's right. And so, and if things went wrong, I th I saw him just go a little nuts. How, what was, I mean, you, you, you were so smart and so helpful to him. What did you have to do to, to get him to calm down or could you get him to calm down? Well, I, uh, quite honestly, uh, we had a pretty good relationship and he he would listen and uh, I would talk to him and tell him that he, he uh, like uh, you're, 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 you're uh, charging the wrong guy with the crime. And, uh, and uh, that I could usually call him down. Well, but how did you do it? I mean, what? Uh, I don't know. It, it's each you know, incident was, you know, another incident. I'm sorry. I, it's all right. It's all right. Uh, tell me about, uh, now you mentioned Judy Garland. Uh, I, tell the story, if you would, uh, about Judy Garland and the press conference that she didn't want to have. Well, I was uh, was in London, I think, wasn't it? No, it was. Uh, she was doing a, a a weekly TV show at CBS, and uh, uh, a fellow that was working for me at the time was. I assigned him to Judy Garland. There were the people that worked for me. They were all assigned to various clients. And um, if I can interrupt by just for a moment, I mean, you 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 started Guy McElwain and Jay Bernstein and Bob Den Gillian and Dave Gersonson, along with many many more. But I, I knew all those guys, and they all learned from you. So I just wanted to yeah. put those to that. But. Uh, you know, you must forgive me. Ninety-five years old, I forget a lot of things. But, That's okay. Um, I think you're doing great. I'm trying to think of the Judy Garland. Uh, uh, oh, she yeah. didn't. She didn't want to go to the and talk to the press or something. Yeah, uh, she is having a well, frequently uh, uh, public arguments with her spouse. I've forgotten the guy's name. Uh, was it Sid Luff? Yeah. And um, so she uh, an announced that she wanted to have a press conference at, at the uh, taping, uh, following the taping that evening. And, um, and uh, I get a call from a guy, McElwain, who was with her. And uh, I said, tell her she can't do it. We're not going to have a press conference. 
she's in, in, in you know, deep enough now that uh, the, the PR is, stinks. And tell her we're not having a press conference. And he said, I've already done that. You come out and tell her. And so I went to, uh, to, to CBS and, and to her, her uh, dressing room, which was just off the stage. And there was a yellow brick road from this, her dressing room to the, uh, uh, to the sound stage, which I thought was sort of cute. And uh, so I told the uh, guy McElwain, I said, get uh, David Beagleman and Freddie Fields, they, they were her managers. And I said, get him to the studio right now. I want to have a meeting with him and we're going to talk Judy out of this press conference she wants to have. And so McElwain says, they won't talk to her. They, they, <laughs> they tried and there's no way we can stop this press conference. And I said, well, watch me. And uh, I went to the studio and McElwain met, met me there. And no Freddie Fields, no, they, they didn't want to touch her with a 10 foot pole at that point. She was held down to, to, to uh, do a press conference and uh, awaken the world to the fact that her husband was a, should be jailed or whatever. So I get to uh, the dressing room and I knock on the door and uh, who is it? It was Judy. And I said, Jim Mahoney, what do you want? I said, I want to talk to you. And she said, I don't want to talk to you. And I said, we're not having a press conference. And the door opens and she comes flying out. I, I had just barely got in the, in the, in the dressing room. And uh, she come flying at me and said, we're doing a press conference. I said, no, we're not. You 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 embarrass yourself to the world. We'll just get through this in the next twenty four hours, and, and um, you you'll be better off for it. And she said, "I'm doing the press conference." And I said, "No, you're not." And she with that, she says, "You son of a bitch! Don't you think I can act?" I said, "It's got nothing to do with it." With that, she came at me and she was swinging, and she, she was the only client to ever hit me. <laughs> and i uh, i said uh, yeah, you're fired she screams at me and i said it, it, it makes no difference you never pay me anyway she was a deadbeat so I'll never forget and the next night um i was representing dino's lodge and uh, there was a new uh, piano player coming to work and um, i should be there for that his opening I've forgotten who the piano player was. And uh, Bill Miller, maybe. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, he's a good guy. But uh, uh, Judy comes in, and it was like nothing had ever happened. She comes comes over, gives me a hug, and said, Hello, darling. How are you? Yeah, what are you? Wow. That, that's typical Judy Garland, though. Wow. Well, speaking of Dino's, I think that we have a picture of Frank and Dean with you, uh, Jen. Maybe you can put that one up. There you go with Frank and Dean and uh, you and Jim Bacon. Wasn't that Jim Bacon? Yeah. Yeah. I, that could be, you know, an opening for the uh, Rat Pack somewhere. Right. Right. Well, is that me? That's you. Oh, I'll be there. Right behind Jim Bacon. It could be, uh, you know, uh, uh, Cyril's, or, or, or I mean, uh, the, the Sands. Right, could be the Sands, yeah. Hoff, Dad was in that picture you showed of Frank and uh, Mia as well. If you look in the yeah. top corner, he's peeking out just as they're leaving their wedding. Put, put that picture back up if you can, the one with Mia Farrow and Frank. We'll look at it. In the upper right. Oh, yeah, there he is in the upper right corner. <laughs> wow is huh. that is that is, isn't that a nancy that sure looks like nancy that doesn't look like mia you're right that's you and nancy when oh, she yeah. got married right you're right that is nancy's wedding yeah hello. yeah there you go hello <laughs> leave it to dad to point that out to us huh now what now what happened jim 
finally your relationship with Frank ended. How, what what happened? How did? <laughs> well, uh, we had many discussions about his trip to Australia and uh, the the Far East, and uh, and he we decided there's the press had already been done, and wherever he was appearing, it was already sold out. And he was romancing uh, uh, Mia at the time, and uh, he didn't want any interruptions with, with that uh, coupling. And so uh, I said, "Well, Frank, I, I represent a, a, a some uh, uh, whiskey companies and and uh, wine producers, and I've been invited over." And he just says, "Go, absolutely go." Maybe maybe you can we'll meet up in uh, London, but you should go. I said I'm taking uh, Pat with me, and uh, and it, it, it's really a, a brief vacation. He said absolutely go go go, and uh, so I was in uh, in uh, England. I was at uh, Lynn Eagles, one of the great golfing resorts over there, and. Uh, I took my son Jimmy with me, and we're walking through the parking lot to get out to the golf course at Glen Eagles. And I hear a voice from, from behind, and it's a familiar voice. It was uh, one of the broadcasters from CBS yelling at me, and he said, Mahoney, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Your client's in jail. What the hell are you doing here? And it turns out he was right. Sinatra had been arrested in Australia. And what the charges were, I don't know. But uh, the, the, uh, it got so uh, out of hand that the prime minister got involved and uh, they refused to refuel Frank's plane. I guess he'd said something to, about the press in Australia and uh, their $2 hookers and whatever else he said. It was terrible. And so they froze him, and he, they wouldn't fuel his plane, so he couldn't go anywhere. And uh, and no one else would fly him. And, uh, and I found out later that one of my good friends, it was Sinatra's makeup man, his name was... Uh, 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 oh, geez, I knew him. Yeah. Uh, shotgun? Shotgun. Shotgun Britain. Yeah. Shotgun told me that uh, Mickey Rudin did me in. He's saying, telling Frank, where's Mahoney now that you need him? He's in, having a vacation in England. And uh, whatever the case, Frank bought it. He was furious with the, the, the whole deal in addition to uh, the, the, the press. But uh, I. So uh, I was fired. Did uh, your, your, was your life easier once Frank was no longer your client? A few days later, Neil Diamond hired me. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Neil Diamond was, was blowing people away. I mean, he was uh, the hottest artist in the country. Right. Well, Jim, uh, I, I, there are so many more stories that I really, I, I tell everybody, if you look over Jim's uh, right shoulder there, there's a, there's the book, Get Mahoney. And I, I, I've only touched the surface of all of the stories that Jim has. And I thank you so much for spending this time with me. Uh, I know that the audience had to love it. They're just story after story. And I never got to talk about Jack Lemon. Uh, there's a picture, uh, Jen, maybe you put up the picture of him and Jack. Uh, I know was a golfing buddy of yours. Uh, and uh, I think there's another picture that we didn't show of, of Jim with Lee Marvin. Uh, maybe we can put that one up too. There's, uh, that's Michelle Triola, right? No. Oh, who is that? Uh, I am. His high school sweetheart who he married and, and oh right, yes, yeah, she was there in Finland with me when we made Gorky Park. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, Pamela. Yeah, Jim, you don't look too happy that day. Well, we were in the courthouse. This is a, the 
beginning of the uh, uh, the case of uh, with Michelle. With Michelle. Ah, uh, well, I got to tell you again, Jim. Thank you for this. I hope you've had a good time. I know that our audience had a great time, and uh, I can't wait for them to read the script. Uh, re read the uh, the book. Jen usually has a, a a question or two that she likes to ask at the end of the interview. So, Jen, take it away. Um. So we have two very important questions that we ask all of the guests that join us. Are you ready? I'm. I'm ready. Okay. What is your favorite film? And what is your favorite TV show? Because we are the Motion Picture and Television Fund. Casablanca. Well done. Cheers. Really? Look at how easy that was. <laughs> wow, you had that at the ready. I, uh, I'm sorry. I, I, uh, I'm a little slow with the, at 95, forgive me. At 95, you were amazing. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Thanks, uh, thanks for that information. I'm going to hop off. You guys wrap up. And uh, don't forget that Urban Zen Meditation is coming up at 1230. Okay. I'll see you guys in a little thank bit. You. Thank um, you. I just, again. We, we watched your interview yesterday with Jimmy Burroughs. We are set, we're both huge fans of his. Uh, uh, you, you read the book. You know the story about uh, Leroy Neiman coming out to the set. Yes. That was yeah. uh, he, he's a good guy. He's, uh, as you said, a member of Bel Air, and uh, he's terrific. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm sure you watched the U.S. Open the other day. Every minute of it. I love that young kid winning. I thought that was great. Yeah. Freda, did you have something you I, wanted to say? I just want to jump in to thank you both for a really engaging, insightful, entertaining interview. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Sean, thanks for your help. Thank you. Jim, again, I'm going to get to Palm Springs and come Bye. see you and give you a hug, buddy. You'll love it. We love to have you. Thank you. Thanks. Take care.